So 1 Peter chapter number 3. Also, if you want to grab Hebrews chapter number 10, at the same time, we'll go over there in a second. And if you're wondering why my eyes are very, very red, I was not getting high in the parking lot before church tonight. <laughs> Me and Wyatt went riding back basin. I got all kinds of dust in my eye. Leanne came in and she's like, what is in your eye? And there was a bug in my eye, actually, and she got it out. I thought there was something in there. Um, my goggles were all dirty and like, so I didn't wear them. And I, at one time I had to take my helmet off because there was a bug like crawling around in my ear. <laughs> Wyatt got a bee in his helmet, but he was wearing goggles. But anyways, yeah, so I brought a bug back with me in my eye. It was dead. <laughs> anyways, Hebrews and 1 Peter. We're going to start in 1 Peter. We've been going through this book now for several Sunday evenings in a row. And uh, we're talking about suffering last week, how God basically is telling us that he would rather us suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. It says that it's pleasing to him if we suffer for well-doing um, rather than evil-doing. And then he gives us an example in verse number uh, 17. We'll start there. First Peter 3, verse 17. It says this, For it is better... If the will of God be so, that ye suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Um, first of all, verse number 18, For Christ also hath once suffered for for sins. There is a lot that could be said. I think you could preach probably a whole month just out of verse number 18. We're not going to do that, but I think it's so cool uh, to understand the final sacrifice that Jesus made for us. That's why on the cross, he was able to say, it is finished. It was a once for all sacrifice. In fact, there is no more sacrifice or atonement that can please God other than what Jesus provided for us on the cross. Um, to know that once for all, Jesus paid our, our sin debt as a Christian, that's like what our main focus is on. That is the pillar of the Christian life. That's the pillar of the gospel is that he died in our place once for all and then was resurrected uh, to give us eternal life like if that isn't what your everything is about then a lot of times you have no foundation to stand on so to speak and I think uh, there's a lot of different uh, religions that try and keep Jesus on the cross right and there's a lot of religions that uh, will uh, re religiously try and crucify him over and over again. But the truth is that um, there is death has no more power over Jesus. He died once for all. In fact, turn to um, Hebrews chapter 10, if you would. Hebrews chapter 10, and it gives us a good picture of the Old Testament. Um, I'm going to start in verse 1. We'll read quite a few verses, but just follow along and then Kind of, I'm not going to talk a long time about it, but let the scripture kind of speak for itself. Hebrews 10, verse number 1, it says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins but in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year you guys remember that right the high priest would go in he'd make a sacrifice every year he'd go into the holy of holies um, uh, verse number four for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins wherefore when he cometh into the world he saith sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not but a body hast thou prepared me. And whose body was that? That was Jesus. 
in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure then said i lo i come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will o god above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law then said he lo i come to do thy will o god he taketh away the first that he may establish the second by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. So this goes along right with our passage in First Peter chapter number 3, that Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust. Um, the price for our sin has been paid in full. Even our own suffering cannot pay for our sin. But the suffering of Jesus Christ paid for it once for all, which is why we can have so much confidence as a Christian to have access, as we've learned in 1 Peter, that we have been made a holy priesthood. We don't have to go to a, a priest. We don't have to go to somebody else. There's one mediator between man and God, and it's the man Christ Jesus. And so now because Jesus has went into uh, the Holy of Holies and has placed his own blood um, as the ultimate sacrifice, we now have direct access to God the Father. The Bible says um, it was the just, for the unjust, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin. And then it also says, uh, the unjust. So for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So it's like the good news is this. If you were born unjust, then the payment for your sin was made. Uh, there's not one person that's, that's excluded from the gift of the gospel not one whosoever will may come you know there's different uh, churches that would preach that there's only so many people that can get saved there's churches that teach uh, something that's false that God chose these people to go to heaven and he chose these people to not be able to have the chance to go to heaven but in other words didn't condemn them to hell they have no choice in the matter um, there's a good book called What Love Is This? Uh, God says the just for the unjust. So it's very clear that if you were born unjust, he paid the price for your sin. Something that I want to spend a little bit of time on is if you'll look in the middle of this verse, it says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. A lot of times in the Christian churches, you're going to hear a lot of preaching about salvation almost as if it's um, a, just a get out of hell ticket or salvation is just um, about going to heaven. You hear a lot of talk about, uh, well, in heaven, I'm not going to um, there's not going to be tears or I'm not going to have this disability or once this pain will go away. And while a lot of those things may be true and are true, which I'm looking forward to a lot of those benefits of going to heaven. Um, I'm looking forward to being able to run and, and jump and uh, what else can I do? Somersaults. Somersaults. Jumping jacks. Um, <laughs> Indian leg wrestle, you know, <laughs> stuff like that. So while there's so many different things that, yes, as Christian, God gives us a little glimpse of what heaven is going to be like. There's nothing wrong with daydreaming about that or reading about that. But the purpose that Jesus died once for all, the just for the unjust, 
it, according to this verse, was to bring us to God. And so as a Christian, understand, don't make salvation just all about um, what we get after we die. But it's always been about a person. It's always been not just about a place, but about a person, right? Heaven is about the person of Jesus Christ. So if you take Jesus, if you take God out of heaven, then it ceases to be heaven. Yeah. So as a Christian, when we are looking forward to going to heaven, we're ultimately should be looking forward to meeting our creator because we know that he's a faithful creator. Yeah. Um, when, a, when a Christian begins to really grow and mature in their walk with the Lord as a disciple, it's because they're not just understanding more and more uh, facts about God's word, but they're getting to know more and more the person of God's word. I had a teenager ask me a really good question this morning. They asked the question about, can wisdom... We always preach like you need wisdom, you need wisdom. The, the book of Proverbs is about getting wisdom. And he asked me, uh, can wisdom become an idol in and of itself? And I thought about it. And I said, that's a really good question because, yeah, I think so. Uh, uh, the two guys on the road to Emmaus, as Jesus walked with them after his resurrection, uh, they were talking about the resurrection and Jesus kind of conveyed himself away, didn't uh, release his identity to them, kind of hid that. And as they walked, uh, he began to ask them questions. And they're like, are you a stranger here? You don't know what's happened? Uh, the person that we thought our, was our Messiah was crucified. And some of the women in our company, they went and they said, uh, angels told them that he was resurrected. And Jesus on this walk, he began to go through the Old Testament and he began to teach them all the things that concerned Jesus Christ in the scripture. You guys remember when the wise men came to Herod um, and or they came and they were looking for the star that was pointing to the Messiah where Jesus would be born. And uh, Herod, he goes uh, to the scribes and the Pharisees and he asks them, uh, where is Christ going to be born? Born. That organ does that every now and then. It's like awesome. Where is Christ going to be born? Um, so he goes to Herod, and Herod goes to the scribes, and he says, Hey, where is Christ going to be born? And they tell him exactly where he's going to be born. You can find him in Bethlehem. And they point the wise men where they should go, and they go, but the apathy of the scribes and the Pharisees and everyone else. They, they knew the scripture, they knew, they had the wisdom, the knowledge, but they uh, had apathy concerning the person of Jesus Christ. And the whole thing is, uh, Christianity is about a person. You shouldn't ever come to church and leave with just head knowledge, being able to win an argument, knowing your apologetics. Being able to argue with the Mormons or the Jehovah's Witnesses or somebody else you disagree with. Coming to church and knowing the Word of God isn't just about uh, getting to know uh, all the answers to the questions that your neighbors have. While that's good, the truth is we come to get to know a person, the God of the Bible. So as we, as we grow and we mature and we're spending time in God's Word, it's not just to win arguments, but to get to know a person. Uh, my, my niece, um, Seneca, she goes to UCLA and she sent me something that she needed answered. It's a bunch of questions. I don't know what class it's for, but um, it's a bunch of questions that she asked if I would fill it out. And it's part of something that she's turning in for homework. The very first question was, what... If any, what uh, religion are you a part of? And so in my answer, I was basically saying this. I hate to even call it a religion because it's not because Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship with a person. Religion is something that means to bind. Right. Whereas Jesus does the opposite of that. He says the truth will make you free. And so Christianity is about a relationship with a person. You guys remember in Psalm 73, Asaph, 
Um, it's a psalm of Asaph, and he writes, and here he is a, a choir leader, if you would, a music man, if you would, and he's a believer of the God of the Bible. And in the very beginning of Psalm 73, he talks about the fact that um, his feet had slipped because he got his eyes on the prosperity of the wicked. And here she is, a, a man of God who's leading people, pointing people to God, and the music and the influence and the, uh, the blessings, if you would, or the, uh, man, I don't know, financial gain, every, all the toys that the world had. He got his eyes on those, and he's like, he started thinking like, man, how come I have it so bad? How come your people have it so rough? And you go down in Psalm 73, you read it when you get home, and he says, when, I cons or when he thought about the next generation coming up, he says, I thought about the next generation. And if I were to say, I'm going to go do what they're doing, then I'm going to offend this next generation. I'm going to detour them from the truth. And then he said, when I thought about that, um, I'm paraphrasing, but he said when he went into the house of God, he understood their end. And he goes down on saying like, man, how foolish was I to start thinking that way? And he gets down into verse like 23, 24, 25, somewhere in there. And he says, uh, he says that their end is destruction. And then he goes on to talking about his end. And he says, whom have I in heaven but thee? Yes. And there is none else besides thee. And he starts to go on realizing that heaven is not just about a place, but it's about a person. And so in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 18, when he goes to, to tell us, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, understand that you don't have to pay for your sins as a Christian. You don't. Jesus already did that for us. The just for the unjust. That he might bring us to God. There's a bigger picture than just uh, being part of a program. It's, it's knowing a person. And then the Bible says, Being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Jesus Christ was put to death in the flesh. That's why... Um, uh, in Hebrews 10 where we just read but a body thou hast prepared every time that we do we come up here and we do communion and and uh, our pastor says uh, would you please thank the Lord for uh, the wafers or the body that was broken for us and we go and and communion is a picture of what Christ who Christ was and what he did for us on the cross, right? The crackers represent Christ's body who was broken. But what was in Christ's body that was so precious? It was God's blood. Yeah, it was God's blood. And so although I think at one time uh, we were started the practice of doing like whole crackers and breaking them up here, I think I was the one that was like, uh, can we not do that? Um, I get the picture. I get the picture. It's Christ's body being broken, but my hands are always filthy. So unless you want black crackers, um, let's not break the crackers up here anymore. But the picture is that a body was prepared. Why, why the virgin birth being so necessary? Because God's blood had to be placed in that child. So the Bible says in Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, somewhere in there, that God purchased the church with his own blood. Crazy. So God was able to become a man in the fact that God prepared a body to take away sacrifices once for all. So the priest year after year after year after year would go offer the same sacrifices to take away the sin of the world. And Hebrews 10 tells us that it couldn't really take away sin, but it was a picture of the ultimate sacrifice that would one day come. 
and all of a sudden this body was prepared and whereas the priests would go in every year every year there wasn't a chair in there they were constantly walking in there they were listening for that bell they were listening hey if the bell stops that means he went in there he wasn't worthy he had sin pull him out with a rope because we're not going in there into the presence of God but Jesus when he took away the sac when he was the sacrifice once and for all um, the Bible says that he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, done. No more sacrifice for sin. Now you can enter in with boldness to the Holy of Holies. You can go before God and, and I mean, you could get a hold of his throne and tell him what is on your heart. And he puts your tears and your prayers in a bottle. He keeps them. His prayers are open to hear what you have to say. The Bible says that uh, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened or made alive by the Spirit. Um, I thought this was pretty cool. Um, where did I write this down? So we're told here that Jesus was made alive by the Spirit. In Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4, we're told that the Father raised him up by the glory of the Father. And in John chapter 2, verse number 18 through 22, the Bible says that uh, Jesus said, um, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And he wasn't talking about the literal temple, but the Bible says that he was speaking of his body. So you have all three persons uh, taking credit for, rise, for raising Jesus up again. You have the spirit, you have... Uh, the Son, and you have the Father. Pretty cool. Um, let's hasten, and we'll get done with this chapter. All right, it says this in verse number 19, by which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison. In other words, the Spirit raised him from the dead. The Spirit also led him, uh, just like the Spirit led him into the wilderness. Um, the Spirit also led him into prison, to, to preach to the spirits. Um, look what it says in verse 20. Which sometime, referring to the spirits, were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing. Was a preparing. Wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So here, God is giving us the picture of salvation. Uh, referring to the ark that Noah made. So it says, while, while Jesus went into the prison to the heart of the earth to pre preach to these spirits, it says, which these guys were disobedient, while Noah, while the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. So, there's a lot that could be said here, probably a whole nother message right here in these verses. But it's basically saying that it doesn't tell us what the message was. It doesn't tell us what Jesus preached to these spirits that are in prison who were disobedient. But I don't think it was the gospel. I don't, want, don't think it was like, hey, here's your second chance. Um, here is your opportunity to receive me as your savior it was obviously after his um it was after his death and before his resurrection that he preached this um i think it was more like a message of every knee will bow every tongue will confess and the bible says in verse number 21 the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's crazy, too, because I didn't even really put this together until right now when I was reading Hebrews chapter 10. It talks about having a good conscience um, because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Um, so he's very careful here to point out that it's not the not water baptism that saves a person. It's not the water that washes away your sin. But here, where he gives us a good picture though, and he tells us, look, the flood 
that water came and certainly did wash away. It was God's judgment on the sin. But God saved those who believed in him. Noah and his family, eight souls were saved. So he's very careful to point out that it's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. It's not the water. I, I explained this to some of the teens this morning. Um, we have some teens that have been saved but have not been baptized yet. And we talked about what baptism is. It doesn't save a person, but it's a picture of salvation. It's like me putting on a wedding ring or taking it off. If I take off my wedding ring, I'm still uh, married. Um, but it's a picture saying that I said yes to my wife and I said no to every other woman. That's what this wedding ring represents. And so it's a picture of being placed into something. That's what baptism does, right? Uh, it's to dip or to immerse. Um, so as we're placed into Christ, we identify with the death of Christ, just like we're uh, identified with Christ in his resurrection, which is why it says in the last verse, number 22, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers uh, being made subject unto him. So Jesus, after his resurrection, has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him, which we also read in Hebrews chapter number 10. Christ is exalted, or Christ by his exalted position um, is exalted. Oh, I wrote this totally down wrong. But basically what I meant to say is that Christ um, has been exalted, we know, by where he's at, at the right hand of the throne of God interceding for you and I on, on our behalf. When we don't know what to pray, he's there interceding for us. It's to our benefit that Jesus is not here right now and that he's in heaven, having given us the complete word of God, giving us the earnest or the down payment, the spirit, and is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. Um, I read something, and I'm going to read it to you guys because it's lengthy. But Jesus has gone into heaven, and it is better for us that he is there. Um, Spurgeon related this to how the high priest ministering for Israel on the Day of Atonement disappeared from the people and went behind the veil. Though he was not with them, he was with God, which was better for them. The high priest was more useful to them within the veil than outside of it. He was doing for them out of sight what he could not accomplish in their view. I delight to think that my Lord is with the Father. Sometimes I cannot get to God. My access seems blocked by my infirmity, but he is always with God to plead for me. Our connection with Jesus is like the little boy with his kite. His kite flew so high in the sky that he could no longer see it. And someone asked him, how do you know it's still up there? And the boy answered, I can feel it pull. We can't see Jesus enthroned in heaven, but we can certainly feel him pull us toward himself. Since Jesus has gone into heaven, his church is safe. Let not his church tremble. Let her not think of putting out the hand of unbelief to steady the ark of the Lord. The history of the church is to be the history of Christ repeated. She is to be betrayed. She is to be scourged. She is to be falsely accused and spitted on. She may have her crucifixion and her death, but she shall rise again. Her master rose, and like him, she shall rise and receive glory. You can never kill the church till you can kill Christ. And you can never defeat her till you defeat the Lord Jesus, who already wears the crown of triumph. And that was said by Spurgeon. I think a lot of times we can take our eyes off the person of Christianity. We can take our eyes 
off of the person and off of that relationship and get it onto a place or a program or winning an argument or other people. When in reality, our Christian walk is about walking with a person. So when you come to church, it should be my goal. When I come to church, it should be my goal and your goal to just point people to the Lord. How awesome is he? How, how much he wants to work in your life. What he's already done to uh, pave the road. We've talked about our testimonies and how God is just like at work when we can't even see him and we can't even acknowledge it. Look, there's no doubt that the devil wants to attack us and he wants to attack our church. He wants to scatter the sheep, which he's been successful at to some point or another, at some point or another, or to one degree or another. He's been able to scatter sheep and shake up marriages and shake up homes and relationships from parents to their uh, children. He's been able to come in and he wants to attack it. But if we as Christians will say like, hey, uh, I realize that hell, hell cannot, uh, man, the verse just escapes my mind. Um, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. God's church is just fine. Amen. His church is just fine. The devil can't come in here and do anything. The church of God is just fine. And you know what you and I, our responsibility is to do? is to realize that heaven's not just about a place, but it's about a person. That Jesus Christ already one time, one time, took away our sin, buried him in the deepest sea behind his back, removed him as far as the east is from the west. He has an awesome life for us to live, an awesome life of joy for us to live, of peace, of love, he wants us to put on the person of Jesus Christ. And look, when the devil does come and he tries to shape th shake things up, understand that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness, which we just learned that Jesus is, has all authority over all that. So, hey, the people that have been absent, um, the people that have been, maybe you think, uh, MIA. You know what? The devil's just rattling their cage. You know what? The church is fine. Just love God, love people. Uh, pray for our church and, and stick together. When opposition comes, that's time to be here. That's the time to read. That's the time to pray. And that's the time to realize hey, this Christian life, it's about a person. That's the number one preeminent. That thank you so much for dying in our place, for rising again from the dead, uh, so that we could walk with you, that we could talk with you, that we could just have fellowship with you, that we could enjoy this life as you uh, intended us to enjoy it. Um, I pray that tonight, if there's anyone in here that has maybe taken their eyes off of the purpose of Christianity, and they've turned it into a religion, that you would help them to realize, God, that you never planned for it to be a religion, but just a relationship with a person. Help them to get their eyes back on you and uh, that you would bless them in their life, that you would meet the needs that they have. Um, if there's anybody in here that's not saved, I pray that you would help them to come to a place where they know Christ died, a just person died for the unjust person. And I pray that you'd help them to come to a place of faith. Um, believing that you died in their place and rose again from the dead. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. With heads bowed, eyes